hear the echo for a second or two. Now we're going live streaming. Mm -hmm. Good. But it's, uh, there's usually a 30 seconds delay or something. Mm -hmm. You have an echo for a second or two. There you go. Now um, we're live streaming now. So no more funny jokes. Funny. <laughs> Always good. But, uh, All right. Not personal joke, maybe. Martin is not here. And Karen. Uh, Dr. Karen, I don't see it. Right. All right, so I think you have the uh, co-host privileges. Yes, I can, yes. I can get people. Uh, so updated. I am going to mute myself out of here. If, no if anything happens, just you can go me, call me at the phone. I'm yeah, yeah. Around. Okay. yeah. No, I think it should be no problem. Oh, and yeah, uh, yeah for the rest, I think uh, you have 20 to 34 people already in there. Mm -hmm. YouTube Six, and the other one, typically have about 150, 150 mm -hmm. people around mm -hmm. yeah, all the time. So it will show yeah. up in a minute. OK. No worries. Have a good night, Thanks. 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 Great. A couple of weeks ago, we had Henning uh, give a talk, sailing house, and you know, he also said that he got his first shot, first vaccina vaccination. So, okay. Oh, there's Karen. I'm just promote Karen as well. And I think, uh, I know, Booker, do you know if Martin is going to join or is there something else he? Is committed to. I have no idea. I didn't talk okay. about it. Uh, hi, Karen. I would suggest, oh, yes, okay. In, in 10 seconds, it's uh, three o'clock. Yeah, yeah, then do we'll I also have a meeting afterwards, so I might need, if the discussion goes for very long, I might quit the discussion before the end. That's the advantage of the online meetings that, uh, yes. you know, <laughs> or like uh, with Hyro, you can have stuff in parallel. So, um, I think we are nearly ready to go. Just give me give one more minute. I'm just going to check if I see Martin. It's kind of nice to see so many you know, familiar names online. Uh, it's, of course, not so nice that you can't see them all in person. But, uh, yeah, it looks like we're going to get a good crowd today. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm... I'm, I'm not missing traveling so much, I have to say, with two mm. little ones. But No, I agree. I, I think we will be traveling less, but I do miss, like, you know, being able to talk to people also in the lab, you know, yeah. seeing what, what people, what is not working, instead of just seeing the polished talks. But, yeah. Yeah, that's true, yeah. I think it's a good thing that we can easily stay up to date with uh, what's happening. Okay, good. So I think it's uh, 3 p.m. Um, so then, yeah, let me uh, all uh, welcome you, uh, in particular on behalf of the Spy Spin Phenomenal Disciplinary Center, as well as the uh, Collaborative Research Center Spin Plus X. So this online seminar series is co-organized by Jairo Sinova and Karin Evershaw-Sitte on the side of SPICE, and uh, by Martin Eschlimann and Burkhard Hillebrands in Kaiserslautern, as well as myself in Mainz on behalf of the Spin Plus X Collaborative Research Center. And as you, most of you will know, this is a webinar format, uh, meaning that we will uh, stream this uh, on uh, YouTube as well as uh, via Zoom. And uh, then we usually do not take questions during the presentation. However, once the presentation is over, you're most welcome to either put questions in the chat, raise your hand, and then I'll promote you to be able to ask your question and then Chiara is going to uh, answer the questions uh, live. Um, we always have this meeting at uh, Wednesdays at starting at 3 p.m. and just for the next couple of meetings. So uh, we have today Chiara Ciccarelli from Cambridge, which I'll briefly introduce in a minute. And then Uli Novak is next week from Constance. And then we have a SPICE workshop. There will be no uh, presentation in, in early May. And just one uh, a very quick uh, shameless self advert. We also have a lecture position available for five years in Mainz. If you're interested or you know anyone, you know, have a look at this very uh, briefly link or just talk to me, send me an email, and then uh, we can uh, provide more information on this. And now, most importantly, a quick introduction for Chiara. So um, she is um, 
originally from Italy, uh, but has spent quite a lot of time in the UK. She did her PhD at the University of Cambridge in 2012. And then uh, she was also a postdoc. And in particular, uh, since 2019, uh, she is uh, a permanent lecturer in Cambridge. So it's great to have someone permanent in this exciting field in uh, Cambridge as well. And she has worked on a range of uh, topics. And if you look at her publications records, it's very impressive. Um, in particular, she's been looking at ferromagnets, but also superconductors. And uh, now here it's been charge conversion effects at inversion asymmetric magnetic structures at these superconductor ferromagnet interfaces. So she's joining two of the most exciting topics in condensed matter physics. And yeah, so before becoming a, a lecturer, she was also a Royal Society University Research Fellow, which is one of the high accolades in the UK system, which very often leads to a permanent position in academia, which also worked out for her. So without further ado, Chiara, we are very much looking forward to your presentation. So please go ahead and share your screen. Okay, I'm going to and I'll uh, stop sharing on my side. Okay, and I should be able to share your. Okay, do you, do you see it? Yes, looks perfect. Okay, go ahead. Good. Well, thank you for the nice and extensive introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here, although in a virtual state, uh, to, to tell you about a project that started about uh, uh, two or three years ago in collaboration with the Department of Material Science uh, here in Cambridge, uh, which are the real experts on superconductivity. Um, I'm just a microwave technician, I would say, but uh, it's a nice it's a nice collaboration that uh, um, that involved, uh, as I said, uh, from the materials department, uh, Jason Robinson and uh, Mark Blamayer, who is now retired. Uh, uh, and I, of course, I need to mention Kurok Gion, who did most of the measurements when he was a postdoc here in Cambridge and now moved to Halle uh, to work with Stuart Parking. So the aim of this project was uh, to investigate, to study really spin uh, um, transfer into a superconductor. Um, this is not uh, a new, I mean, the, the appealing uh, part of this project is the fact that obviously if we have a superconducting uh, current, uh, which is also spin polarized, uh, then we have the possibility to transfer spin angular momentum and uh, uh, with all the, the associated benefits such as exerting torques and so on, uh, but obviously um, reducing on losses to zero, so um, at very low power. Now, um, this is not a new topical research. Several groups have uh, approached this study in the, in the past. And uh, um, although, so it's not changing my slide. <laughs> just restart the sharing. Sometimes there's an issue okay. that doesn't change the slides. Just stop sharing and let's start again. Hmm. Otherwise, just uh, go to a normal mode in, in PowerPoint and try that again. Hmm. I don't know what's going on. Maybe we try, maybe restart PowerPoint. I know that Microsoft sometimes has non-reproducible effects. Yeah. So I mean, that this is what I sometimes do. I just restart PowerPoint. That mm -hmm. usually does the trick for me. Okay, let me see. Okay, let me start again. One of my colleagues said Microsoft is not an exact science. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, okay. You see it now? Yes, yes. Perfect, okay. go ahead. So, I mean, um, so, I mean, the, the easiest, so let's see what people have done in the past. Um, so the easiest way to, to inject a spin polarized current in a superconductor would be to apply a voltage uh, at a ferromagnet superconducting junction. Um, now, uh, let's assume that we have, let's start with a, a normal metal superconducting junction. Let's see what happens. Imagine that you apply a voltage EV, which is uh, lower with respect uh, um, to the, um, uh, which, which is at the Fermi level. Uh, so it's within the superconducting uh, band gap here. Now, when a charge arrives at the interface with the superconductor, the only way to enter the superconductor would be for this charge to combine with an opposite its spin charge on the normal metal side to form a Cooper pair inside the superconductor. 
Now, this is uh, this process, which is called under reflection, then leaves uh, a, a hole behind with an opposite momentum. So this hole travels away from the interface. So we effectively have two parallel conductive channels, one for the electrons and one for the holes, that lead to uh, an enhancement of the conductivity of, of the junction with respect to the normal metal alone. Uh, as you can see from these measurements, for example, which were taken at uh, niobium copper um, uh, point contacts. Now, if we replace the normal metal with a ferromagnet, uh, uh, let's imagine an extreme case in which we have a 100% spin polarized ferromagnet. Now, in this case, the density of states of majority spins is different than the density of states of minority spins at the Fermi level. And if in particular, we have 100% spin polarization, when a, a majority spin arrives at the interface, it doesn't find any mate to form a Cooper pair. So this blocks charge transport across the interface and leads to a reduction of the uh, conductivity. As you can see from this other measurement, taking at niobium chromium oxide uh, um, uh, junctions, point contacts. Now, this, which would seem like uh, um, a negative result, is not necessarily a bad result because this effect, uh, so the, 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 the expulsion of a spin polarized uh, spin current from the superconductor has been used, for example, to measure the spin polarization of, uh, of metals. Now, if spin transport is not necessarily easy in a superconductor below the, the, the gap, below the band gap, and this is because Cooper pairs are in a singlet state, the same is not true for quasi-particles. So these particles that live above the superconducting uh, band gap. In this case, uh, spin transport has uh, especially been studied by using non-local geometries, where ferromagnetic contacts have been used for both injecting and, uh, and measuring and measuring the spin um, uh, spin uh, transport. Now, when a voltage is applied, so the, these ferromagnetic contacts are usually separated by a tunneling junction from a, a superconducting channel, in this case, aluminum. Um, so by applying a voltage, um, spin polarized charges tunnel into the superconductor, generating an equilibrium charge and spin accumulation behind the contact, which then diffuses away from the contact. And we can measure the spin accumulated under the second ferromagnetic con uh, contact by measuring a voltage. Now, what people have found in this type of geometries is that, uh, uh, okay, is that uh, um, the charge, um, charge uh, uh, transport is decoupled from spin transport. They're characterized by different uh, uh, diffusion lengths. Now, while um, uh, charge, tra charge transport decays uh, with a time scale in the range of picoseconds, that has to do with the quasi-particle lifetimes before they decay into Cooper pairs, spin transport is in, instead, spin diffusion is instead, uh, uh, the spin lifetime is instead associated to the um, inelastic spin scattering events that occur at the, uh, above, in the states above the superconducting gap. And uh, this uh, um, uh, scattering can also be even suppressed by applying a magnetic field that induces a Zeeman splitting in the density of states of the quasi-particles. You, you can see here in this graph that uh, the, um, um, the spin um, at, uh, length scales, uh, attenuation lengths reaches values of even or the order of 10 micrometers. So much above those of, of charge diffusion lengths, um, which you can see plotted here in, uh, in blue. And of course, as I said, is increased by applying a magnetic field. Now, um, this uh, long, uh, uh, so this obviously long uh, spin diffusion lengths and, and, and lifetimes for, for spin in the quasi-particle states are, are obviously an advantage, but uh, quasi-particle states differently from the states below the superconducting gap uh, have a resistivity associated to it. So uh, we cannot reach the optimal condition of uh, non -ohmic, zero ohmic losses. So in our project here, what we wanted to do is to uh, investigate again, spin injection into, uh, into a superconductor, but uh, um, instead with respect, differently from the previous works, um, excluding charge transport. So what we're interested in here is uh, a pure uh, spin transfer into the superconductor studying this. And the, the easiest way to do that from the spintronics point of view is to use a spin pumping layout. So the first structure that we have considered in our studies is shown here on the left. 
it consists of a, a permaloy, six nanometers permaloy layer, sandwiched uh, between two nobium layers of uh, bearing thicknesses, and everything is capped with, uh, with copper. Now, all the structures I'm going to tell uh, about have been grown by sputtering in the Department of Materials um, with a single run, so without breaking the vacuum. Now, the spin pumping experiment consists in gluing this structure upside down on a waveguide and passing a microwave voltage. So when uh, an external magnetic field is swept. So when the resonance conditions are met, what we see is a resonance in the uh, transmitted power. Um, now, one thing I have to say is that uh, um, uh, the, the presence of the permalloy here in contact with the, with the superconductor affects the superconducting characteristics. In particular, there is uh, an inverse proximity effect for which the exchange field of the permalloy closes, quenches the superconductivity at the interface, and this results in a reduction of the TC of the superconducting transition temperature, as you can see in this uh, in this graph here. For example, for a for a very thin nobium layer in the range of 7.5 nanometers, we don't even see any superconducting transition, while TC slowly increases as we increase the thickness of uh, of the nobium. Okay, so a very uh, important quantity uh, for our measurements uh, here is the um, is the line width of the ferromagnetic resonance that we measured. This is this is just a sample, an example of uh, uh, resonances that we measured for a, a fixed thickness of nobium and uh, a different uh, uh, microwave frequencies and a different temperatures. Now, from this line width, we can extract uh, the Gilbert damping, which tells us immediately um, uh, how how efficiently the precessing magnetization of the permalloy loses angular momentum into the environment. Now, uh, the line width is also related to what is called homogeneous damping, which is instead uh, correlated uh, uh, to uh, homogeneities in the system. And uh, um, it's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the dynamic part of the damping, the Gilbert damping. Now, how do we extract this quantity? We extract it by plotting the ferromagnetic resonance line width as a function of, uh, of frequency. And uh, um, uh, from the gradient of these lines, we extract the Gilbert damping, while the homogeneous damping here corresponds to the intercept action with the y-axis. Now, these, these plots here are for different temperatures above and below the superconducting transition temperature and for different thicknesses of the nobium layer. So the immediate, immediate thing that you notice um, is that if we increase the thickness of the nobium, so for example, 30 nanometers, 45 and 60, you see that there is a very clear change in the gradient, in particular, uh, the gradient uh, um, decreases as we cross the superconducting temperature. So in going from above to below the superconducting transition temperature, we see that the, uh, the gradient, uh, the Gilbert damping uh, decreases. Now, whereas, there isn't any substantial increase in the intersection with the y-axis, so there is no obvious uh, um, fluctuation in the homogeneous part of the uh, uh, associated to the to the line with uh, um, changes associated to the homogeneous part, as we will also comment later on. So in this graph, we can then safely take the uh, the change in the resonant line width as a qualitative uh, um, description to qualitatively describe the trend of the Gilbert damping. So you can see here as a function of temperature, as we cross the TC, which is shown by this dotted line, the Gilbert damping endures uh, an abrupt decrease. So this means that uh, as the, uh, the, um, uh, superconduct the, the gap, the superconducting gap opens in the density of states, all of a sudden the um, angular oh. momentum is less if, if effectively lost into, into the nobium layer, um, into the environment, which is in this case is, is, is the nobium. Now, this is, agrees very well with the understanding that we have of conventional superconductors. Now, above TC, we have the nobium is effectively a metal. So the theory of spin pumping uh, developed for normal metals is still valid. Um, and, uh, uh, and we have a, a, spin, diffusion, um, a spin diffusion model uh, for which spin propagates into the, into the nobium. Now, when uh, we cross TC and uh, a gap opens in the density of states, you see that the spin accumulated in the ferromagnet via ferromagnetic precession cannot, um, cannot be taken up by the Cooper pairs that are below the gap. And this is because they are in a singlet state, therefore they are inadequate to, to take on any spin. Whereas the quasi-particle states that are above the gap, which are efficient spin channels, as we have seen, become more and more energetic, energetically inaccessible. 
and this be this results in the in, in, in the reduction of dumping as we have seen this result is also uh, very well known in the literature. Um, previous experiments on similar structures obtain exactly the same uh, result. For example, in this uh, in this paper here, we see a decrease, uh, uh, the same decrease in dumping was was observed uh, um, in ferromagnetic resonance experiment uh, when crossing the, the TC. Now this. Uh, um, the, the fact that then, so in this case, what seems to appear evident is that uh, the, the spin transfer into the superconductor in this case is mediated by uh, quasi-particles. And the fact that we see a reduction in dumping is correlated to the fact that these quasi-particle states become higher in energy as we cross CC. Now, to further confirm this, we can fit uh, the data, uh, the Gilbert dumping, for example, as a function of nobium thickness um, by using um, the very the existing theory developed for normal metals, treating the quasi-particle states as uh, normal metal states, if you want. The only thing we need to take into account is the opening of a gap in the density of states, which uh, here I've shown a gradual opening because of the inverse proximity effect. As we said, the nobium in contact with the ferromagnet uh, is not superconducting because, the because of the effects of the exchange field. So we have a gradual opening. Um, and at a depth that corresponds to uh, about a, one coherence length, uh, about 16 nanometers in the dirty limit for nobium, we have a, a full opening of the superconducting gap in nobium. So if we just take it into account, then we can still use the theory of normal metals for, 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 for fitting completely our data. From this fitting, we also extract a, a spin diffusion length, which corresponds to about uh, 20 nanometers in the superconducting state of, of nomium. And this uh, 20 nanometers corresponds then to, uh, to a certain um, uh, spin lifetime, which is correlated in our case uh, to the lifetime of, uh, of quasi-particles before they decay into, into Cooper pairs. So this further confirms the fact that uh, uh, spin uh, pumping is mediated into the, the, the nobium layer by the quasi-particle states. So, so far, so good, nothing strange. The situation becomes uh, different in a different type of layout. So in this type of layout, uh, the central part is exactly equivalent to the previous layout. So we have a permaloy layer sandwiched between two nobium layers. The only difference is that now on the other side of nobium, we have a five nanometers uh, thick platinum layer. Now, the original idea behind this structure was to create a very efficient spin sink on the other side of, of, of nobium that would have taken um, all the spin crossing the nobium. Uh, um, now, however, the results that we had on our line with analysis were um, pretty uh, dramatically different and uh, um, made us, uh, uh, forced us to, to reinterpret, to, to reconsider our, our understanding of spin transport within a superconductor. So what we see here, here again, we plotted from magnetic resonance line width as a function of, uh, of temperature for different thicknesses of, of nobium. So for a thickness of 45 nanometers and 60 nanometers, we see the expected trend that we also saw before with the decrease in dumping as we cross TC. The strange thing happens for an intermediate thickness of nobium of 30 nanometers and 15 nanometers, where we instead observe an increase in the, in the line width. So this seems to suggest that the spin pumping efficiency actually improves, is increased as we cross, as we cross the superconducting temperature and therefore as the um, uh, a gap opens, a superconducting gap opens in the density of states. Now, just uh, uh, as a safety uh, check here, uh, I also plotted the Gilbert dumping, which we extracted from the gradient of the um, frequency dependence of the line width. Um, and uh, you can see we have we, we recover exactly the same behavior. So for 30 nanometers, we see that this Gilbert dumping increases uh, uh, as we go uh, below uh, TC, whereas for 45 nanometers, this decreases. And this further confirms the fact that the homogeneous dumping here doesn't play any role. So um, this is just to, to compare, just to give you a, a, a visual, an immediate comparison between the, two, between the two type of structures. In the case, in the first case, when no platinum was present, we saw a decrease in the Gilbert dumping, always regardless of the thickness of the nobium. In the case where platinum is actually on the other side of nobium, we see an increase uh, for, uh, for some thicknesses of, of nobium. Okay, so before we, we, we go on, I would like to further comment 
on the uh, on the uh, on the possibility of having other uh, effects in the in the in the um, in this uh, in determining the, the, this language change. In particular, um, we know that Meissner screening might uh, might contribute um, in changing the electromagnetic environment of our permaloy film. So Meissner screening. Um, acts uh, by uh, expelling uh, electromagnetic field lines from the from the nobium layer, and this leads to a rechanneling of the electromagnetic field lines, which might affect also, um, which might create uh, inhomogeneities in the electromagnetic uh, uh, landscape, but also might change the effective field felt by the permaloy, and this obviously has consequences on the ferromagnetic resonance that we measure. So to test that, what we have uh, observed is that uh, this is not a concern, this is not a problem, if we use thicknesses of niobium which are below the London penetration depth, which for niobium is about 100 nanometers. So in all the measurements that we'll uh, um, describe, uh, we always use niobium thicknesses below 100 uh, nanometers, usually in the range of 30, 40 nanometers. And we've seen that uh, Meissner screening does not play any, um, any evident effect, uh, does not affect our data so much. On the, on the contrary, if we start having a thickness comparable to the land of penetration depth, for example, 100 nanometers, and we repeat the experiment that we have just uh, described by plotting the ferromagnetic resonance line with as a function of temperature, we see again here an increase below JC. And this is strange because in this case, we don't have any platinum on the other side. So we wouldn't expect to see this increase. But we need to be careful here. So we need to separate the contribution from the homogeneous uh, um, contribution to the line with, uh, to the homogeneous damping and the Gilbert damping. And if we plot them separately, you see that the Gilbert damping decreases as we would expect from uh, quasi-particles mediated uh, spin transport. And uh, whereas the inhomogeneous damping is the one uh, uh, increasing. Um, and this is, uh, as I said, associated to the inhomogeneities in the electromagnetic landscape uh, induced by Meissner screening. The other thing that confirms this is the fact that uh, um, if we plot now the microwave frequency, uh, the resonance frequency as a function of a resonance field, we can plot this data, we can fit this data with a key tell. Uh, formula, but we need to account for an additional term in the effective field felt by the permaloy, uh, the permaloy layer when we cross uh, TCU. So when we are in the superconductive phase, the effective field felt by the permaloy changes abruptly. And this is again a consequence of this rechanneling uh, due to uh, mass screening. So uh, going back to our data, the other thing that we did um, was to analyze so the uh, the effect so uh, the increase in damping below uh, tc as a function of nobium thickness as you can see the maximum effect in this case is measured for a thickness of about 30 nanometers now um this plot here at the bottom pl uh, plots the from magnetic resonance line width as a function of nobium thickness Again, above TC, uh, we see that the data is uh, fit, fitted uh, by using um, the standard theory of spin pumping for normal metals. But below TC, we uh, observe uh, a trend that is unfitable with this theory. And in particular, um, we see uh, the trend of an increase in line width with decrease in temperature that we wouldn't uh, uh, be able to, 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 to explain with, uh, with quasi-particles mediated uh, spin transport. Now here, just a, as a safety check here, what we show is that uh, TC as a function of nobium thickness. Um, uh, so uh, with, when we have uh, um, uh, bare nobium, this is the trend that we, that we see uh, as a function of thickness. When nobium is in grown in contact with the permaloy because of the inverse proximity effect, the TC endures a rigid shift downward, but the situation is not changed if we then have platinum on the other side. And so this shows that the platinum, the presence of platinum on the other side does not affect the superconducting properties of, of the nobium layer. So just a safety check. Um, the, um, so now we went into investigating really what the role of platinum was in this uh, in these measurements. So we did that by considering different um, uh, normal metals in contact with the uh, with the niobium on the other side. We investigated platinum, tungsten, tantalum, holmium, iron, manganese, and copper, and we saw the effect of increasing damping below TC was only measured for heavy metals, highly spin orbit coupled metals like platinum, tungsten, and tantalum, whereas nothing was observed, for example, in the case of copper or iron, manganese, and holmium. 
Um, now, this immediately suggested uh, to us that uh, um, spin orbit coupling might play a role in what we uh, see in, 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 in the fact that we uh, observe. But also, these results were important because they allowed us to further exclude that quasi particles play any role in, uh, in uh, mediating spin uh, transfer into the superconductor. The reason for that is in the inverse, spin, is in the, um, inverse proximity effect here. While uh, platinum, tungsten, and tantalum um, have a proximity effect for which a, a superconducting gap actually opens in them when they're in contact uh, with a superconductor, the opposite happens in the case of our manganese, which is an antiferromagnet. In this case, the exchange field um, acts in the opposite way, suppressing the superconductivity at the interface. So if we had any uh, quasi-particle mediated effect um, uh, for example, uh, cross tangent of reflection or, or electron co-tunneling, where, um, uh, uh, where uh, spin transport still occurs via the formation of Cooper pairs, but these two effects are both triggered by um, uh, quasi-particles on the two sides of the interface. So if we had something like that, then we would expect a larger effect when we had a higher density of states for quasi-particles at the interface. So when we had a quenching of the superconductivity, so, for example, in iron manganese, we would expect a higher effect, but this is not what we observe. We observe a higher effect in in um, in the case of platinum, tungsten, and tantalum. So, once we have uh, established that quasi particles probably don't play a role in explaining uh, our results, um, then we needed to to start really thinking whether uh, Cooper pairs could play uh, a role in in this increase in in in, in mediating spin transport. Now, this is not uh, a recent topic of, uh, of research. Many different groups have, have wondered about the role of, uh, of Cooper pairs uh, in mediating uh, spin transport into, into, into the superconductors um, it, from both the theory and the experimental point of view. Now, uh, what the majority of these studies have focused on is uh, the understanding of the physics at the superconductor ferromagnet interface. Now, at this interface, because of spin dependent scattering, what happens is that the singlet uh, states are partially projected into uh, spin zero uh, triplet states. Now, the spin zero triplet states have uh, a coherence length that goes like the diffusion constant D over the exchange field into the ferromagnet, uh, which is typically, which is about 10 times higher with respect to the superconducting gap. Um, they, they, so the attenuation of, of these uh, uh, singlet states uh, is, uh, follows a, typically, a, a typical oscillatory behavior superimposed uh, to an exponential decay and translates into a length scale of the order of a few nanometers, one, two nanometers. So these spin zero triplet states are not efficient uh, uh, in mediating spin transport uh, from the ferromagnet into the superconductor. But their creation is, becomes key, becomes crucial, because then from this uh, um, short range uh, uh, correlation, we can generate longer range correlations where the two members of the pair have equal spin projection on the quantization axis. So these are equal spin triplets. And the coherence length for this equal spin triplets is uh, not determined by the exchange field anymore, but the KBT constant. So typically it's an order of magnitude higher with respect to the short range correlations and extends therefore in the tens of nanometers range. Now, the experimental works that uh, um, sought for the presence of these long range correlations in the, in the past uh, focused uh, on, uh, um, on uh, uh, understanding what, what's, the most, uh, what's the most efficient way to convert short range correlations into uh, long range correlations. And one, a very successful experiment uh, done uh, by Robinson et al. in 2010 considered um, instead of rotating the states, the spin zero triplet states into spin one triplet states, uh, rotating the quantization axis. This can be achieved, for example, if you have a non-homogeneous ferromagnet in contact with the superconductor. So in this experiment, they considered uh, an SFS, Josephson junction, in which, uh, and, they, and they measured the critical current for this junction. So when, no, uh, when cobalt, uh, homogeneous ferromagnet was present in the junction, they could see that the, uh, um, the critical current had uh, expected oscillatory behavior superimposed to an exponential decay. But when they um, uh, put a, a thin layer of holmium between the cobalt and the niobium, 
you could see a, a much longer decay length. Now, holmium is a natural uh, spin helical um, magnet with an helical uh, wavelength, uh, which is compared, which is lower with respect uh, to the uh, correlation um, um, correlation length of, of Cooper pairs in the range of a few nanometers, uh, four or five nanometers, if I remember well. So when this helical uh, ferromagnet was here at the interface, they could see a much longer decay length. And this was correlated to the presence of long range um, uh, uh, spin, equal spin triplets. Now, this layout structure was also explored in, in a range of different, uh, with a range of different materials where Holmium was substituted with different, uh, with different materials, but they all coherently agreed on the fact that when the uh, magnetization is not homogeneous and the interface, then this is a way to, 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 to generate long range correlations. The other type of experiments that people, layout structure that people considered is an FFS type of structure. Here, there are two ferromagnetic layers uh, with uh, uh, misaligned magnetization. What people have measured here is that TC, the transition temperature of the superconductor, depends on the relative alignment between these two magnetizations and the change in TC is maximum, about 50 millikelvin, when the two magnetizations are uh, perpendicular. So th this um, sort of artificially reproduces the helical uh, structure of the, of the holmium. And again, these results are explained with a, um, with a, um, with, with a generation of long range equal spin um, correlation triplets states, which open up uh, a, a leak, a leakage channel within the uh, ferromagnet where superconductivity can leak thus reducing the TC value. Now, if we see this past literature, um, it is hard to find a parallelism with our, with our layout structures, because in our layout structures, our ferromagnet is homogeneous. We have a six nanometer spermaloy layer, and there is no reason to believe that it is not. Um, so uh, we cannot directly uh, explain our results with, 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 this past, uh, with this past literature. However, uh, we were we can be inspired by a, a theoretical work uh, by Bergeret in uh, published in 2014, which suggested that in the case of a homogeneous ferromagnet, therefore when the quantization axis is pinned to one particular direction, we can still induce the, the rotation of the spin zero triplet state into long range spin one triplet states, for example, by a spin orbit field. Now this results resonated pretty well with our uh, with our results because uh, we have just shown that the spin orbit uh, coupling seems to play uh, an important role in our results. We only see the effect when the niobium, when the superconductor is in contact with the highly spin orbit coupled material. So this is the theory to which then um, Montiel and uh, Eschrig, uh, two theorists that collaborated in this project, um, to which they were inspired to develop the theory that then explained our experimental results. No, although I'm not necessarily uh, comfortable in, 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 in explaining the theoretical framework, um, uh, I, I want to just mention maybe the, the, the important, the key points of this theory in relation to our experimental findings. Um, so this uh, theory is based on the Husserl uh, formalism um, for diffusive transport, we adapted for, for the spin to include the spin degree of freedom. They have used, uh, um, uh, they have studied uh, a structure very similar to the experiment, to the structure that we have used in our experiment with a, uh, with a, with a superconducting thin layer sandwiched between a homogeneous ferromagnet and uh, a known uh, magnetic material with a high spin orbit coupling. And the first thing that we can comment on in this structure is the fact that the two ingredients that were necessary, were considered necessary in Bergeret's theory to induce a long range correlation, which are the exchange field and the spin orbit coupling, in this structure here belong, are, are separated to two opposite sides of the superconductor. Obviously, we have the exchange field at the interface with the ferromagnet, but we have the spin orbit coupling on this other interface with a uh, with a uh, heavy metal. According to this theory, however, if the thickness of the, the superconductor is comparable to the uh, Cooper pairs coherence length, then the, um, the spin zero triplet states that are generated at this interface because of spin dependent scattering can reach the opposite interface where they can be rotated by the spin orbit field into spin one triplet states. Now, these equal spin states 
because the platinum is also uh, has also a very high spin susceptibility, induce an internal uh, exchange field. So this uh, provides us with the two ingredients, the exchange field and the spin orbit coupling now on the same sides of the interface, which enhances the spin one triplet creations and then opens up a very efficient spin channel inside the superconductor where spin can be pumped from the ferromagnet into the uh, platinum spin sink. Now, so from this theory, what appears is that the spin orbit coupling is not the only necessary requirement, uh, but also the fact that platinum is very close to um, uh, a paramagnetic instability. Now, the graph at the bottom here uh, shows the fact how the spin current uh, scales with the Landau parameter, where a value of minus one, minus one corresponds to a paramagnetic instability. And you see that the spin current only picks up when we have a sufficiently high value for the Landau parameter. Now, the theory reproduces also the thickness uh, dependence with respect to the nobium thickness dependence that we see, where a peak is observed uh, at a thickness that corresponds to about twice the coherence length for our for our nobium film. Um, this uh, factor of two here appears because uh, when, the super, when the nobium is too thin because of the inverse proximity effect, uh, the interface with the ferromagnet, as we said, the superconductivity is quenched. So the, uh, what, what appears is that the, the, the best, uh, uh, the best uh, condition that allows for uh, the, the, the spin uh, zero triple states to reach the opposite interface is represented by uh, having a thickness that is about twice the coherence length. But this, of course, depends on the boundary conditions. So these thickness dependencies might be different in different uh, type of heterostructures and when different materials are used. So now this is the theory. Uh, the, the reason why I wanted to mention a little bit about this theory is the fact that it also inspired uh, the following experiments that I will tell you about. In particular, um, we have seen already that the spin orbit coupling is probably uh, an important element in our, in our experiment. But in the following experiment that we made, we uh, really started to wonder about the, the role of the internal exchange field in platinum. So we were wondering whether enhancing this internal exchange field in the spin orbit coupling, uh, in the spin orbit coupled material, then we would have also increased the efficiency for uh, of the conversion from the short range to the long range correlation, uh, therefore enhancing the spin pumping. So to do that, now we know from, from the literature that uh, because of the high uh, spin susceptibility in platinum, it is pretty easy to, to induce an internal moment. For example, in this work, what is shown is that the moment in use in, in platinum when it is uh, uh, exchange uh, uh, coupled to different uh, uh, ferromagnetic layers. You see that, for example, in the case of uh, platinum iron, a moment of up to 0 0.6 mu beam can be induced, which is maximized at a thickness of platinum of about uh, one nanometers. So uh, inheriting these results here, we have decided to use a slightly more complicated structure. Again, the central uh, part of the structure is exactly the same as we have explored so far. The only thing that we did was to add an extra iron layer, 2.5 uh, nanometers iron layer on top of platinum with the intention to further increase the, the internal exchange field uh, in, in the platinum. Now, um, Obviously, here we have another ferromagnetic component. Uh, in addition to the permaloid, there is also the platinum layer. So we expect the magnetic moment, uh, the magnetization of the structure uh, increases, and it rigidly increases uh, regardless of the uh, platinum thickness. Um, so this, this allows us to, uh, to exclude that, um, that the presence of platinum um, or interface effects might deteriorate the quality of, of the iron uh, in this case. It doesn't seem to be the case. The other thing that we observe is that TC now has a strong dependence on the uh, platinum thickness when the iron is present. And this confirms the fact that there is probably an inverse proximity effect induced now, not only at the interface with the permaloy, but also at the interface with platinum because of this internal exchange field. So this confirms that uh, the, the exchange field is actually, uh, is actually uh, uh, induced uh, by, by the iron inside the platinum. Now, obviously, relevant to our fMR measurements, we have um, we have we expect now two resonances to appear because we have two ferromagnets. However, they are sufficiently uh, different, sufficiently uh, distinguishable, so that we can focus um, and limit our analysis to the uh, resonance uh, from from the permaloy. Indeed, all the uh, line width analysis that we did until now. So. 
obviously in this in this paper uh, all the details different characterizations have been have been done to 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 check the quality of the devices and everything and uh, for this i will point you to this paper but the, the salient the, the the summary the important result is represented by comparing these two graphs here now here we plot the ferromagnetic resonance line with as a function of platinum thickness above and below the superconducting gap when no iron is present so when the platinum is not uh, proximized by any ferromagnet, and in the case where the iron is instead present. Now, in the first type of layout, we see that uh, above TC, we, uh, we, we recover the, um, the platinum thickness dependence that we, we, we have seen in any type of spin pumping experiment uh, in, in, in platinum with a, with a line with saturating at a thickness of about uh, three, four nanometers. Now, this trend is kept um, uh, in the case uh, of uh, um, when obvium, so below, below the superconducting transition temperature, um, um, meaning that platinum is still functioning as, as the spin sink in this structure here. But the situation is different uh, when the iron is present. So in the, when the iron is present, uh, the maximum effect uh, in the resonance uh, line width uh, increase below TC is observed, uh, is pushed uh, towards lower thicknesses of platinum. And a maximum effect is observed uh, for a thickness of about one nanometers, which corresponds to the thickness in which we have a maximum uh, induced moment uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the platinum. So this seems to confirm that actually the internal exchange field in platinum plays a role as predicted by, uh, by the theory and enhances the creation of long range uh, correlation. Now, the other thing that we uh, wanted to confirm is uh, um, the angular dependence uh, of, uh, of the effect. Now, uh, according to, to the uh, theory by Bergeret, uh, in, the, uh, in the case in which the, the spin orbit coupling is the one inducing the rotation from short range to long range correlation, and in the case in which the spin orbit coupling is basically the rush per spin orbit coupling that we have at the interface uh, with, a, with a heavy metal, so in our case we would expect in, uh, that this is the main uh, contribution to the, to the spin orbit coupling, then the um, uh, the, the efficiency in the conversion, so the, 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 the most efficient rotation is achieved, um, um, depends basically on the cross product between the exchange uh, field and, uh, um, and, the spin orbit, uh, uh, and the spin orbit field. Now, this, uh, um, so the spin orbit field, uh, so, so this is a, a, an important quantity here, is, re is represented by this vector here. So by commutators between A, the A, K are basically the uh, vector potential um, uh, components of uh, describing the spin orbit field. H here is the exchange field. In the case of a spin orbit, of a rush for spin orbit coupling, this reduces to this, uh, to this uh, quantity here. Now we have maximum conversion to long range uh, correlation when this quantity here is uh, as perpendicular as possible to the exchange field. Now you see that, for example, now X corresponds to an out of plane direction. So if we assume an exchange field that is out of plane, you see that this thing will always be parallel to the exchange field. And therefore we wouldn't expect any long range correlation. The, uh, the cross product between this quantity and the exchange field is maximum when uh, the exchange field is tilted at 45 degrees with respect to the plane of the interface where the spin orbit field lies. So we expect a maximum uh, effect, a maximum increase in damping when the internal exchange field in the platinum is tilted 45 degrees with respect to the plane of the interface, which is something that we haven't investigated so far because in all our previous measurements, the magnetic field was always in plane. So the next step was to, to check that and to do by carrying uh, angular dependent studies. Now, before we go into that, we need to be, we need to open another parenthesis here, because as we tilt, um, if we just do fMR uh, measurements by tilting the magnetic field out of plane, there is another effect that uh, uh, contributes to, to, our, to our results, which is the um, uh, nucleation of abrigos of uh, vortices. Now, this uh, um, when we have an in-plane uh, field, the uh, the creation, um, the, the energy associated to the creation of in-plane vortices is, is higher with respect to the um, to the creation of out-of-plane vortices. So, if the thickness of the nobium layer is below the London penetration depth, so for an in-plane field, uh, this uh, the creation of these vortices um, is not so uh, doesn't have such a big impact. Uh, but when we start to tilt it out, the, the field out of plane, then we see a clear effect um, induced by the, this, uh, uh, the nucleation of these vortices. 
Um, so these vortices effectively what they do is basically to reduce the volume of the superconducting regions. Um, now by carrying here in this graph here, I show um, magnetostatic measurements um, carried uh, at different angles uh, of the out of plane uh, of, of the field uh, with respect to the plane of the device. So 0, 45, 70 and 90 degrees. Uh, both above and below uh, room uh, TC. So by subtracting the, the, the data above TC to the data below TC, we can extract the magnetization curves of the nobium layer alone, from which we extract, which is, uh, which is shown in these inserts here, from which we can extract the value of HC2. At HC2, for a value of, of, of field equal to HC2, the superconductivity is completely destroyed by the, the magnetic field. On the same uh, insert, I also show the, the field that we used for our uh, ferromagnetic resonance studies represented by this, uh, th this red line. So you see that as we move uh, out of plane, so as we tilt, uh, increase, tilt the, the magnetic field increasingly out of plane, this uh, ferromagnetic resonance field uh, for a fixed um, microwave, uh, microwave uh, frequency, um, we see that this uh, resonance field moves closer and closer to the HC2 value. And this is because of the in-plane anisotropy of our permalloy. We need, uh, the resonance is observed, obviously, at higher values of the field as we tilt uh, towards the hard axis, the out-of-plane hard axis. Now, from this, from the ratio between the, the, the resonance field and HC2, we can have an estimate of the, um, of the volume, of the superconducting volume that is uh, kept in the structure. And this is shown here in the first column uh, for different tilting angles. As you can see, as we tilt the magnetic field out of plane, this the superconducting volume is reduced from 100%, about 100% to about 37%. This second column here represents the, another estimate of the superconducting volume, which is instead obtained by uh, considering uh, from TC by considering therefore the, the rescaling of the Cooper Pairs coherence length and also the, um, the Latin's constant for the abricot abricots of vortices. And the two values agree uh, pretty well. So, so what, what we confirmed is the fact that as we move out of plane, obviously we have effectively a reduction of the superconducting volume. So let's see what we see. Um, now, this graph here shows uh, uh, two cases, the two cases in which we don't have any platinum uh, layer uh, on the other side of, of nobium, and the case in which we instead have the platinum spin sink. Now, at different tilting angles, which are represented by the, the different colors, we see that uh, the resonance field does not endure any change below TC. Obviously, the resonance field will be different for different tilting angles, but the, there is no impact on the crossing of TC on this resonance field. So this means uh, this gives us um, a way to exclude that uh, effects linked to a master screening, for example, uh, contribute in this, uh, in this case. However, we see a pretty dramatic impact on the line width of our, um, of our resonance. So if we just uh, uh, look at the zero degrees, so at the in-plane data, which corresponds to the, to the orange line, when no platinum is present, we see that the line width decreases, as we have seen uh, before. But this effect of decreasing line width is attenuated if we keep increasing the field out of, out of plane. And this is in agreement with the fact that um, the, the, the suppression of the Gilbert damping here depends on the opening of the superconducting gap. So if we reduce the volume in which uh, the superconductivity is present, then obviously we see a, a smaller and smaller effect. We see this attenuation uh, effect also in the case where platinum is present. Now in this case, as we cross CC, the Gilbert damping increases rather than decreases, decreasing as we had observed, but this increase is attenuated if we keep increasing, if we keep tilting the, uh, the field out of plane. So this uh, further confirms the fact that the increase in Gilbert damping is not, uh, um, is associated uh, in some way with the superconducting part of the nobium, with the superconducting volume of nobium. If we reduce that volume, then we see a, a smaller increase in the a, a, a smaller increase in Gilbert damping. So this result is also very important because it allows us to exclude any role playing played, for example, by vortices in mediating spin transport from uh, the, the, the permalloy into the uh, platinum spin sink. 
So, okay, now that we have established the role of uh, abrigosome of um, vortices, uh, we uh, study the angular dependence of the effect in a better engineered structure. So in this case, instead of applying uh, a, a, an external field out of the plane, we kept the external field in plane. So we kept the permaloy layer, for example, magnetized in plane. But we um, induced an out-of-plane component of the internal exchange field of platinum. So we reduced the, um, we, we, we limited the effect of the out-of-plane field to the interface with the nobium. How, how did we do that? By using a stack structure of this kind. So in this case, uh, the internal exchange field in plasium is induced by cobalt. And in a plasium cobalt plasium structure here, the, um, the anisotropy of the cobalt layer can be varied by varying the thickness. So what we have is that uh, um, below, um, below about 0 0.8 nanometers, um, the cobalt, uh, cobalt is, has an out-of-plane anisotropy. The out-of-plane direction is an easy axis. If we increase this thickness, as you can see here, for example, two nanometers, the in-plane direction becomes an easy axis. So we repeated effective, if, effectively this study for different thicknesses of cobalt for an in-plane applied magnetic field. And from the magnetostatic uh, uh, curves, uh, uh, together with a uh, stoner Wolfarth uh, simulations, we were able to predict exactly the uh, direction of the exchange field inside the plasma, and therefore study how the, uh, the increase in Gilbert damping was affected by this, by this tilting. And this allowed us to produce this, uh, uh, this graph here uh, at the bottom, where we plot the relative increase in Gilbert damping in going uh, below to going uh, in going from above to below the superconducting um, uh, transition temperature uh, as a function of uh, the tilting angle of the cobalt magnetization, which basically gives the tilting angle of the internal exchange field in platinum. So each one of these data points here corresponds to to a different thickness of the cobalt uh, of the cobalt layer, and as you can see, this uh, th this is the angular dependence of the effect, where we see a maximum increase in Gilbert damping at a, a, at an angle of about 50, 50 degrees. Um, now, what you see here is a, a renormalized uh, increase in Gilbert damping, renormalized by the uh, the superconducting gap, uh, and this is in order to take into account the reduction in superconducting volume induced by this out of plane component of the of the exchange field. So by taking that into account, where gamma is obtained by the TC volume, then we, we obtain this angular dependence. Now, again, this, is, uh, um, this uh, angular dependence becomes even more meaningful when we um, compare it to the angular dependence of a similar structure in which we try to suppress the uh, contribution from the spin orbit coupling, from the Rashford spin orbit coupling. How do we do that? By, for example, putting a copper layer at the interface between the nobium and the platinum cobalt platinum stack. Uh, copper is a, a low spin orbit coupling material, so we don't expect any rush for spin orbit field to be present. In this structure, you see the, uh, the angular dependence is, uh, uh, is, is very different and it reaches a maximum, the effect reaches a maximum at 90 degrees. So for example, when, when the exchange field of, uh, of cobalt is perpendicular with respect to the uh, in-plane direction, so to the magnetization of the permalloy. Now, this angular dependence, uh, which is associated to the cross product uh, of the two ferromagnets uh, sandwiching the, the superconductor, has some is, uh, is, is a known uh, is a known effect, uh, which has also been observed in previous experiments. But on top of that, uh, when uh, the spin orbit coupling, uh, the, the rush spin orbit coupling is present, we see an additional angular dependence, uh, um, and by subtracting this contribution to that, we observe a peak roughly at uh, 45, 50 degrees, where we would expect maximum uh, maximum uh, conversion from the uh, from a rush by spin orbit field as predicted by by the theory so this further confirms that the spin orbit the, the, the rush by spin orbit uh, coupling is the one inducing the rotation from spin zero uh, uh, cooper pairs uh, triplet cooper pairs into equal spin uh, cooper pairs now, before I conclude, I just want to give a, a very um, quick example of an application of, uh, of, uh, of the use of uh, efficient uh, spin uh, 
uh, channeling inside a superconductor by Cooper pairs, um, for example, by um, in, in this type of structures. Now, this uh, stack structure is equivalent to the one I've shown before. So, so far, we have done several studies, and all these studies were aimed at understanding what, what, what were the best conditions for um, converting, for generating long, long range efficient uh, spin channels inside a superconductor. So, we've seen that this uh, um, is maximized for a thickness of an obium of 30 nanometers. And it is also maximized when the platinum is exchanged uh, coupled and it has an out of plane component of the exchange field. So we have used the best conditions here, but instead of now using the permalloy as a spin pumping element, we have used it to channel spin waves, magnons, which now these uh, uh, spin waves were generated and detected by two waveguides. Um, in a S12 uh, by, by via a VNA via vector network analyzer. Um, so we measured the, 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 the transmitted power here. And we were able to measure the attenuation length of the, of the spin waves. Now, this uh, graph here uh, represents the intensity of the uh, S12 uh, signal of the transmitted power um, uh, between the two waveguides uh, for different distances uh, between the, the waveguides above and below TC. So you see that when no platinum cobalt platinum spin sink is present, um, so when there is only the nobium in contact with the permalloy, we see that the, the attenuation length uh, um, is uh, increased uh, um, below, um, uh, so the attenuation length, sorry, is increased uh, um, when we go, uh, when we cross TC, when we go to low temperature. And this is because uh, the, 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 the nobium in this case repels any spin. And therefore, uh, doesn't uh, doesn't allow for any spin loss inside it. The opposite trend is observed when platinum cobalt platinum is instead present. In this way, we open up by creating long range equal spin triplet states. Uh, we open up spin dissipation channels um, at the top and the bottom of the permalloy, which instead increase the attenuation uh, propagation length of, of, of the waveguide below, below TC. So this acts as a sort of uh, spin gating, if you want. Um, uh, if we were able to control the uh, conversion of between a short range and long range uh, correlation, for example, electrically, then we would be able to use this type of device as a real uh, a spin gating device. So with this, I conclude and by leaving you with a, with a very quick summary of what we found. So we found that uh, pure spin um, is efficiently pumped inside a superconducting niobium only when this is in contact with a highly spin orbit coupled material. The effect is enhanced, um, uh, which depends on the thickness of the niobium, is enhanced if we also induce an internal exchange field in the spin orbit coupled uh, um, element, in the spin orbit coupled um, heavy uh, metal. And uh, it is enhanced if this uh, internal exchange field is tilted with respect to the plane of the device, if the rush for spin orbit coupling is the one uh, inducing uh, these um, this long range correlations. Now, what I've told you about is summarized in these uh, publications where you will find better details on all these experiments. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thanks a lot. So very exciting talk, lots of results. Thanks, Chiara. So now we have some time. Um, we already have a first question from Igor, which I'm just going to give the floor. But before that, so if you want to speak, just raise your hand or put a question in the chat. So Igor, go ahead. Do you need to unmute yourself? Uh, and, yes. Okay. I, I have a few questions about this material choices. Mm or maybe suggestions in a way. Uh, so this is your effect is um, essentially based on interference between the strong spin orbit in an external layer and superconductor. Uh, have you ever thought about using a superconductor which already has strong spin orbit effects like niobium diselenide or even better tantalum diselenide, uh, say in rhomboidral structure where you have not RARPA but very strong Ising splitting and correspondingly the pairs in each band are not uh, up down minus dinosaur but either up, down, or minus dyna uh, subs. It looks like you can have a uh, new effect there. And the similar question is, um, did you think about using um, superconductors which are uh, close to, magne to magnetism themselves? Uh, not through proximity effect, but um, just in the normal state, like strontium rutinate, for instance. Um, so that's, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is all uh, very very relevant to what you're saying, uh, and uh, uh, there is a wide range of uh, of alternative that uh, uh, these results open uh, open the community for, for for further exploration. Absolutely. I mean, um, these are definitely to consider both both uh, high spin orbit coupling uh, inside uh, the superconductor and. Uh, um, Magnetism, as, as, as you uh, there, there may be a few now short related questions. You used holmium for uh, investigating the spiral effect, but spiral and holmium is based, uh, is formed by rare earth ions, which have very weak coupling to conduction electrons. Uh, what if you would have taken um, a tinderon spiral, like manganese gold or uh, any of manganese stannate, or like many tinderon magnets which um, form spirals? Would that have stronger effect. Yeah, we haven't we haven't used any holmium in our experiment. This, this referred to an old uh, an old paper. Oh, I see. Okay. But uh, uh, my understanding is that as long as the um, uh, so what's important here is the is the wavelength of the spiral, if you want, uh, in comparison to the uh, Cooper pair correlation length. Right, so, but the, the, the but the fact that the spiral itself has a relatively weak coupling with conduction electrons at the Fermi level, you think mm -hmm. that's not uh, an issue? Uh, that might be an issue. I, I'm not sure about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to the okay, next all right, thank question. You. So Max Illin, I took, uh, you can unmute yourself and then ask your question. Uh, hello, Kara. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, what would be the effect if you substitute a metallic ferromagnet uh, layer with insulating ferromagnet layer? Yeah, that's a very good question and we don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. We don't know. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And Tero, you have a question? Yes, thanks for the talk. I, I tuned in a bit uh, late because I had another meeting, but uh, uh, um, I have <laughs> read your papers. The, the question that I have is that as far as I understand, you are measuring your fMR via uh, microwave measurements mostly, but uh, could you also, uh, would it be feasible to do kind of fMR excitation and at the same time, uh, uh, DC measurements, like uh, like uh, measuring the voltage between the superconductor and uh, and and the, and the ferromagnet. Uh, yeah, I mean you need to be careful. Every time you do um, a voltage measurement, you need to be careful because all the currents are shunted through the superconductor. So you have you easily have zero voltage measurements. So I don't know what. No, but, but uh, there is a voltage between the superconductor and the uh, and and the. Uh, um, Let's say in the cobalt or uh, sorry, the the ferromagnet that you are using. Uh, so you can you can put an electrode between, and then there is a fun, some finite resistance in between uh, those those parts. Mm -hmm. So like, like in in this sort of layout uh, out of plane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, there is no technical. Uh, uh, this is technically possible. Yes. Um, yeah. What? Why would the you? Point by point being here, because of what you, what your Gilbert damping is uh, is spin pumping, and the spin pumping generates a, a spin accumulation in your uh, sort of uh, the spin sinks, and, mm -hmm. uh, and and then if you have a ferromagnetic uh, uh, electrode, you can convert this uh, spin uh, accumulation to a voltage, and uh, and then this voltage would be another way to to measure your uh, yeah. spin pumping, but uh, but kind of uh, yeah, the, it would provide a different type of information, and uh, actually, we have a recent theory paper saying showing how this uh, signal should be particularly large in a superconductor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is uh, this would be possible, and it could be an alternative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. So, Carla Chirillo, so you can ask a question. I just you can unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon and thanks for the, your talk. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you expect uh, if you use a simple SF structure, uh, so without uh, extra uh, source of spin orbit coupling, uh, spin orbit, yes, but uh, uh, if the superconductor is itself a spin triplet superconductor? Thank you. If the superconductor is itself? It's what? a spin triplet. So it's yeah, a, I um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. So I, I'm not aware of any uh, type of spin pumping experiment uh, done in this type of structure. I, I'm not sure um, what um, what you would see, uh, to be fair. 
um, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I mean I, I would assume this would be would be uh, would be an efficient spin sink if you want. So that's that's an interesting point. Um, uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a question from Alexander. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm a bit puzzled by this inhomogeneous broadening which you which you report. Is it a, a KTL mode? Uh, experiment in which there is just one vector and, and so 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 then th th there should be some kind of averaging of the frequency and there should be some a single frequency of this ketel mode what are you talking about domains uh, rotating with different uh, frequencies i'm not sure which one are you trying uh, you, you mean the homogeneous broadening that we yes, see yes you, you say that, that part of this line width is, is homogeneous broadening and and maybe, yeah. Cara, maybe Cara, can you just show your screen again because it's a bit yeah. easier if you could just yeah i think so so I think you're referring to uh, maybe this one. This one? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you said that part of this line is not due to Gilbert damping, but due yeah, to- Yeah, I mean, th this is only true. So you see that if we have, um, usually we, we use thicknesses of niobium, which are uh, below the London penetration depth. Uh, so below half. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about the, 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 the the ferromagnet, are you talking about now a Kittel mode of this ferromagnet? So is it just a single single domain? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, it's a Kittel mode for the ferromagnet, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but then it doesn't matter that, that in, in different places I have different magnetic fields or different magnetic surroundings because if it's a single mode, then it's a single mode. So so I'm pro probably I'm, I'm maybe uneducated in this um, broadening, but, but I'm, I'm mm -hmm. probably... Yeah, no, I, I, I um, yeah, what I was saying here is that uh, um, the massless screening definitely induces a, a rechanneling of the electromagnetic field lines. So what we're saying here is that what, when you plot with the Kittel formula, you need to account for a shift. You see the, 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 the plot shifts, and this is accountable by including an extra term in the effective field felt by the, the permalloy. So the permalloy uh, feels a, an additional uh, field, which is due to this... Uh, this repulsion from the niobium, uh, which intensifies the, the field in correspondence of the permalloy. And uh, uh, so we can fit the data with, with this additional uh, term. Yes, is that I can understand fully, but, but why would it influence the, the width of the resonance, of the fMR resonance? And we, yeah, um, I mean, we don't know for sure. We haven't done very um, extensive analysis on that, but this is empirical. So you see okay. here, when we plot, so the, the homogeneous damping here is given by the intersection with the y-axis, and this uh, uh, this variation is, is uh, absolutely uh, important uh, and comparable to the variation in the in the gradient in the Gilbert damping. And this is something that we only see for a, a thick niobium layer, but we don't see for 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 thinner layers in the range of 30, 40 nanometers that we normally use for our experiments. So in our cases, we we only saw this effect for for thick niobium layers. Now, because this homogeneous stamping has to do with, um, uh, yeah, in homogeneities in, in, in the material, I don't know if uh, some... Um, well, you're yeah. talking about just, just some alpha zero, which is not due to spin pumping, but due to some internal mechanisms in, in your permalloy itself. Um, yeah, but it, it, it's, it, it's, I mean, the quality of the permalloy would be the same in the case of thinner yeah. nobium layers. So, so okay. Okay. it really has to do with the, with the, with the thickness of the nobium, I think. Um, otherwise, the growth conditions are exactly equivalent. The, 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 the surface quality, the interface quality is expected to be the, the same. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Alexander Serra, go ahead. So you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you perfect, go ahead. I also would like to comment maybe on this Meissner screening and broadening of the ferromagnetic resonance line with due to the variation of magnetic field due to this uh, screening effect. Principally, I agree with Alexander that it should not influence line width because we really have one mode. This one mode can change uh, locally wavelengths, or, but frequency will, for entire mode will be the same. 
and that is but it depends how strong variates and how um, what is the um, size of this variation in space of a magnetic field if the size of variation in space will be small it will be scattering centers and in such case it should influence the line width because we will have maybe uh, it will be hilbert mode but it will be non-uniform Gilbert mode in the entire sample. We will have some domains with different frequencies. It would be very interesting to analyze these, uh, uh, the size of non-uniformities which are created by Meissner screening in uh, permaloy. It is a very short comment about mm -hmm. this. Yes, are, are you thinking to some sort of like a vortex related effect or? Something such that, well, as domains, for example, if mm -hmm. these uh, uh, um, size of these non uniformities in magnetic field, which are created by screening effect, are close yeah. to the um, wavelengths of spin waves, which non uniform spin waves, which can be excited in permaloid the given frequency in such case ferromagnetic kittel mode can be re-radiated in the secondary spin waves it will be the damping additional damping but if it is a rather smooth variation even strong but smooth variation in a magnetic field inside permaloid it doesn't lead